Hello, welcome to our webinar on powerful DOE tools to catalyze oil, gas, and petrochemical R&D. This is Mark Anderson. I'm engineering consultant with Stadies Incorporated in Minneapolis, speaking to you from my home just uh, east of the cities. And I'm happy to present uh, to you this these tools of design of experiments. My background is chemical engineering, and I had some experience working with an oil R&D at the beginning of my career and did a little bit of work in refinery as well. So this is a good topic for me to discuss. Uh, I'll go ahead and start the slideshow now. And uh, again, welcome. And to make the most from this webinar, uh, we will keep the attendees on mute. Afterwards, I will spend some time and be available for chat. However, it may work out best that if you jot down your questions and then send them to me afterwards to mark at studies.com, then we can give a good answer and you know not use up time unnecessarily. This presentation will be posted to our webinar site and a recording to our YouTube channel. So at this point, I'd ask you to raise your hand on the control panel to indicate that you're able to hear me and you're with me so far. Okay, thanks, Wayne. And any others um, that want to throw their hand up? Great, add, et cetera. Uh, some of the people that we have here, I can see already are very well experienced with DOE, but I assume that some others will not be. And down the line, when we post this recording, I'm hoping that some newbies to design of experiments will uh, pick up on this powerful multi-factor tool. So therefore, uh, expect that this will start off with, you know, really basic ideas about multi-factor testing, and then we'll advance from there to pretty powerful uh, optimization tools for process and mixture. Well, I really like to start at the very basic with a very high level view way above the forest at 20 or 30,000 feet to discuss you know, what the basic idea is of design of experiments. And probably the biggest thing is that it's a purposeful approach. Uh, we're being proactive and changing factors that we can control, therefore uh, able to measure responses and establish a cause and effect relationship where we can predict the response Y as a function of X. Of course, we need to be sure that we're only reacting to things that are significant statistically, let's say P less than 0.05 might be a good, a, a good approach. Now, what's inside this box is gonna be the big question that each and every one of you needs to consider. And uh, primarily we focus on process type studies like time and temperature, but it also could be a product or a formulation and we're changing the components of a mixture. Uh, so that would be fair game. Or even we can do combined experiments that combine process factors with mixture uh, components. So just about anything you, you want to do can, can be accomplished using these tools of design of experiments. And I like to say that uh, consider that you're in a kitchen and you're going to bake a cake. Well, uh, of course, the time and temperature in the oven is going to be really important. But also the components that you put into the cake, you know, the flour, butter, sugar, and eggs or maybe a combination thereof. So it's up to you to decide you know, what it is that you wanna focus your attention to for your research and development. And then uh, number one is gonna be identifying you know, what are the critical to quality responses that you wanna measure. Yield is you know, a common one uh, for uh, oil, gas, and petrochemical. Uh, we also have issues of purity uh, with oil, gas, and petrochemical. So those would be a couple of things that you might consider uh, for responses, but really uh, there's no limit. You can measure you know, whatever you think might be important and see what, what happens to that when you change these factors. Then on this side are the factors. And you know, as I said, you know, common things for let's say oil refining would be the temperature and the pressure and the flow rate and things like that. But you also might have uh, variations in your components of your petrochemical uh, coming in, the raw materials, and that would be something to consider as well. 
Uh, of course, there's always things that you don't control, and that's why we're going to use statistics to identify, you know, what's real and what was just caused by chance. So that uh, basically is, in, in a nutshell, you know, what, what we're aiming for. And really, uh, this, these tools of design of experiments using proactive changes to your factors to see what happens to the responses should work for any process or product. Um, it's just a challenge for you to you know, work out the mechanics of how you can control things and how you can measure things. So uh, with that uh, point made, uh, I'll just ask again to get some feedback. Uh, how about all of you? Do you have some kind of a process product you know, in mind that potentially you could apply DOE to or you have been doing so? I'm assuming yes, but just to you get affirmation on that, uh, you know, put up your hand or some give me some positivity uh, that that you've got something in mind to make use of the DOE. So a little feedback would be would be great uh, if you're with me so far. Uh, press that raise hand button. Okay, thanks, Wayne. <laughs> Somebody's going to have to do it, and maybe you'll be the canary in the coal mine for today's session. Um, because you know, when we're doing these distance-based, you know, presentations, and I can't look you in the eye and see if you know you're agreeing with me, or you're nodding your head yes, or you're shaking your head no, or you're you've fallen asleep, or what. So that's good. Thank you for the feedback. Okay, so now let's get into some actual numbers with the real basic level of design of experiments, which is called a two-level factorial experiment. And this is an actual study that I kind of repurpose, you know, for different uh, industries that I'm talking to, but it was actually a real study that was done and it related to the life of a product. So let's assume in this case that we're talking about the shelf life of a fuel and we've uh, put this product in a beaker on a shelf in, in a hot room and uh, we're, we're going to see how it degrades over time. And let's say that our goal is to double the life in this experiment. And as I said, this was actually done. And the experimenters that, that did this started off with this baseline condition, which is shown here. And they got 17 hours of response. And they were pretty sure that if they increased A, the, this was their primary factor they, they really thought would work, if they increase, increase that from a low level to a high level, that they would get this doubling goal that they that they wanted. But unfortunately, although it increased the response, it didn't double it. So that didn't really succeed. And this is now where we get into the problems of one factor at a time, because all they can really do next is turn their attention to a second factor. Let's say, call that B, and they try that one. And uh, it actually works maybe a little bit better, probably not significant statistically but it definitely is falling far short of two times 17 or 34 so we'd have to consider that to be a fail and then finally they're really grasping at straws and, and uh, getting down to the bottom of the barrel by testing c and going from the low level of c to the high level of c and as expected that does the least of any of the three factors maybe a slight improvement but definitely not a doubling and so it seems at this point that the OFAD one factor at a time experimenter that's using the scientific method is, is stuck. Luckily, one of the engineers in this group attended a class on design of experiments taught by George Box, who was one of the key gurus of design of experiments over the years. He was the son-in-law of Ronald Fisher, who was the inventor of uh, modern day statistics and all. And so this uh, student uh, learned from Box to do something called a two level design represented with the number two. And with our three factors, we put that in as an exponent. And this is really a good approach because it's multi-factor. And it turns out that this creates the breakthrough improvement because it's really a combination of A and B, or what we call an A-B interaction. That's the key to making the breakthrough. And this interaction is actually a two-factor interaction. We can estimate also the interactions of AC and BC, as well as the main effects of AB and C from this experiment. And even this three-factor interaction, ABC, can be, can be estimated. Uh, so it's a very, very important approach to use multi-factor rather than one factor. 
Uh, first and foremost, because we can uncover interactions only by doing this multi-factor approach, never by one factor at a time. But there's also a more subtle advantage built into this test uh, layout in that we have built-in averaging of, of different uh, levels of each factor. So for example, if we look at the right side of this cube, you notice that we have four at the A high level or A plus level. Then if we uh, pay our, uh, uh, put our focus on the left side, we see we also have four at the minus level of A. And this would be very helpful to get a more powerful estimate of the main effect of A. Of course, we also have B at the high level with four, and we also have four at the B minus level. And C has got four by four comparison. And also A, B, A, C, B, C, and A, B, C all have four by four comparisons. So that, that power advantage is, is something uh, in addition to, to having the effectiveness of seeing the interactions. Now the OFAD experimenter would scratch his, scratch his or her head a little bit and say, well, you know, I see your point here that sample size one is probably not good. So if I was to redo this experiment, I would do four at our baseline condition that generated this average result of 17 and then do four at the high level of A. And then we'd have our four by four comparison. Well, okay, fine, but then what about B? Oh yeah, I guess we'll have to do four at the high level of B also. But remember, we also have a third factor C. Okay, we'll do four of those. Well, by the time we're done, with the OFAT, we've got 16 runs to get that four by four power, whereas with the two level design, the multi-factor approach, we only have eight. So in addition to the effectiveness of the two level design to see the interaction, it's also more efficient. And so this is you know, accomplishing the great challenge that Peter Drucker laid out as we came into the turn of the uh, millennium in 2000 that making this knowledge work more productive, you know, will be our great task of this of this century and the entire millennium uh, starting in 2000. And so therefore, it's, I've made it my mission to promote the idea of this multi-factor testing, and in particular, the two-level design. Uh, just a quick survey of the group here, uh, if you would raise your hand, if you've done a two-level factorial design, I know some of the people have because have, I recognize your names. Okay, yeah. And uh, so just as I expected, uh, Wayne, Mary. Um, okay, John and Ad uh, also raise their hand and maybe some of the others. This is, might be something new. And certainly for our audience that will come later for the recorded YouTube, I would expect a lot of people probably never have tried using this multi-factor approach, even just a two-level design. Okay. So uh, moving on from there then, what I'd like to do is provide a good strategy of experimentation for this multi-factor approach. And I don't have to invent this because it's already been uh, laid out, starting with the invention of the two level designs in the 1920s and continuing on into the 30s, it was still being developed by a guy by the name of Ronald Fisher and this was done in the fields of uh, agriculture. Uh, Fisher was an agronomist, and eventually he was knighted, you know, as Sir Ronald Fisher. And with these two-level designs, we can do screening with designs that are medium resolution. And just to give you an idea of, of how this is, is set up, uh, if we go to our tool, Design Expert, and let's say we were going to build a little design. Um, we have the two level designs laid out along this white diagonal. But uh, when you get more and more factors, the powers of two begin to bite, bite you a little bit with the number of runs. And so you can start to do fractions. So here we go from eight factors and 256 runs to a half fraction of 128, a quarter fraction of 64. And if we keep pushing down even further, into this yellow zone, we get a pretty good design choice that I would recommend for screening. And so I'm gonna say, if you're using steady software, look at these yellow designs as a possibility. And then we also have minimum run screening designs. So if you have nine or more factors, for example, we might start to use these specialized optimal designs that are similar to the yellow designs in terms of 
being good for testing the main effects of factors. So with these screenings, using the medium resolution yellow standard designs that Fisher invented, or the more modern DOE that is provided in STATI software with the minimum run screening, uh, you can uh, quickly screen down many unknown factors, let's say eight factors, in 16 runs would be kind of a standard choice, you know, if we go with the original structures that Fisher developed. And what's cool about this is that we can quickly, you know, look at factors we never considered before. And before we focus on what we know are factors to study, we can screen those unknown factors down and maybe tease out a couple down here that are that are vital. And typically it breaks out, let's say 80 percent will fall off as trivial, maybe 20 percent would come in here. So maybe we would throw off six factors and keep two from the screening of eight. And let's say we had three to begin with. Then we go to the next phase, which is characterization. And these designs are going to be designs that are green. Let's just say that we could either do a full factorial at this point to begin to understand interactions of things or do a high resolution, which is going to be one of these green designs. And so in this scenario, we've got three coming in from the beginning and we've got two that we screened down. So now we have a total uh, at the next phase of five factors. And if we do another 16 run design, which is one of my favorites. It's actually a minimum run design for five factors. We would pick this option here, which is a screen design five and 16. Now we also have minimum run characterized designs if you have six or more factors. So we could also do the minimum run option for characterization. So you can see that the STATI software is really laid out nicely to apply this two-part strategy of screening and characterization. Now, if we add center points at this stage, and center points are very easy to add in um, anywhere along the way, but for example, with this standard design of five factors and 16 runs, here's where we would add the center points in, let's say four center points. We then can look at the average of the response at the center relative to the outside, and we can do a test that has a significance associated with it, and if it's significant and important, we can then go to the next phase. And at this point, we're gonna do at least three levels of every factor and do what's called a response surface method or RSM. And this is where George Box came into play because he's an inventor of the original RSM design, which is called a central composite. Co-inventor of that and also many other tools for DOE. So there's a, a real nice lineage here between Fisher and his son-in-law, George Box. So let's take a look at uh, some of these different options in the context of oil, gas, and petrochemical. And by the way, I don't want to uh, ignore the fact that whatever we, we do, if we don't see curvature and we decide that we can just press ahead, or we do see curvature and we do the optimization experiments, of course, we're always going to want to do some kind of confirmatory studies, either running our optimum condition a number of times, and there's tools in the, the software to, to accomplish that. And hopefully it's all good and we can, we can celebrate. So that's the strategy of experimentation. The main advantage is going to come at the beginning with the screening and characterization. Okay, so let's move ahead then and talk about this screening and characterization phase where we're quickly sifting down a large number of potential factors, discarding the trivial many, following up on the vital few, and, if, and ultimately increasing the resolution of the experiment to be able to resolve two-factor interactions, which are oftentimes the key. So here's an example from uh, oil, gas, petrochemical. This would be the type of thing I would do as a chemical engineer. And this happens to be a continuous stirred Star, uh, tank reactor or C star reactor. Uh, we're going to focus on five key factors feed rate, catalyst level, agitation rate, temperature. And then this is a categoric factor because there's some thought that maybe we, we don't have to spend all the time to batten down the hatch on the, on the tank. Maybe we could at least leave it open and not have to uh, blanket it with nitrogen. 
and that would save a lot of time. So this one is a very questionable factor, but as long as we can do this many factors in a reasonable number of runs, why not throw in some things that are a little bit marginal? So the first consideration was to do a full two-level factorial, but it was gonna to be too many for one day. So the experimenters considered two options. One option is to split their design into two blocks. So how would we do that? Uh, and by the way, I, I would recommend putting center points in um, for this design. So just for argument's sake, I'm gonna leave the center points in and let's say that we break it into two blocks. The trouble with the center points is gonna add more runs but let's just see how this builds up. So we would go to the next. We would identify some uh, information about what happens to break this up into two blocks. There's a slight loss of information. I, I'm just skipping by that. Typing in the name units, the type of factors, the lows and the highs, and notice the, four, the fifth factor is a categoric factor, which is fine, it just has two levels. Now we're gonna uh, do two blocks with center points. So the center points are gonna be duplicated in each block. And this would be day one in this scenario, and this would be day two. Okay, and then we're just looking at one response to yield, but there could be many responses, you know, the purity and things like that, but let's just focus on one. And this is very important to consider how much of a difference is important at a minimum and what your normal variation is. With these two entries, you can generate a power calculation, and you can see with this many runs, with 32 runs, the additional center points, the power is, is very good, you know, more than what we really need, which is fine. George Box said, when in doubt, build it stout. Now, what we've created here is a, a layout in randomized order, and in day one, we're doing half of the runs in an optimal half fraction. And in some of these runs are actually center points in the first group, and then we have center points in the second group. And I could cut down on those center points, but it doesn't matter because at this point they said, no, you know, we don't wanna do this many runs. We don't wanna run um, over two days. And so they decided that actually, they really would rather run just a half fraction and do it in just one day. And in fact, they also decided not to do the center points, which I, I normally wouldn't recommend. But it is what it is. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this file. And this is the actual experiment. And uh, if I identify the space point type, you can see that uh, we don't have uh, any center points here. Now, I'm covering a lot of material. And so what I would like you to do is uh, consider, you know, what, what questions you might have about this. And you can try throwing them in on the chat. I've got a couple of them here now, and I'll try to address that. Um, but because of the amount of material that I'm trying to cover, I may not get to all the chat. So what I would suggest is um, at this point, probably it might be better to just jot your questions down and save them and then email me afterwards or I can go over time at the end and I can cover some of the chat, you know, that does come in between now and the end of the presentation. But as long as I've got the chat window open, I'll just try to address a couple of questions from Ad. Uh, Ad says, sometimes I have a linear model with curvature. I then make a response surface design a quadratic model. However, I sometimes keep a curvature. Do I have to go to a third degree model? Uh, usually the, the second order quadratic model will suffice to fit most of the complex nonlinear behavior. And the reason is add that oftentimes combinations of second order two factor interactions plus the squared terms, you know, form kind of a complex polynomial model that will adequately, adequately represent a surface even though it's curved. You can go to a third degree model uh, that has like say cubic terms in it. By augmenting, there's a tool in design expert that will do that. And so you could do that, but generally speaking, you can find you know, a decent fit you know, just using the quadratic. And do you want to distribute center points more over the runs? And that's a good point. I usually don't like having center points one after the other, which happens in a random order, 
So you can simply go in and swap some of the run numbers out so that you space out the center points. That's, that's a very good point. So thank you for those questions. Okay, so now I'm gonna press ahead with an analysis of this. And the first thing I'm gonna do is just sort this from low to high. And what I observe is my goal of seeing at least a 3% yield improvement is accomplished. And if my normal variation is 2%, probably this range is significant. And so therefore, just kind of picking the winner here, I can see that it's probably gonna be good to, to blanket this with nitrogen, which is what we were doing. And probably higher temperature is gonna be good and higher catalyst would be another thing that I'm picking out from here. So already having done this multi-factor experiment and by being bold and setting factor levels, we've generated a big range in response and we probably already know the answer to, to getting the yield up, you know, maybe even over 90%. So that's pretty cool. Now I would do some graphing and this would be good also if you had blocks to see the difference between the blocks and just do simple scatter plots of the main effects. And here we notice this strong red means a very high correlation positive on the catalyst percent. So right away, you know, we're seeing that that catalyst increase probably is significant. And then to a lesser extent, the temperature. But there could be interactions of things which we won't see from this uh, simple scatter plot. So now we have to begin uh, analyzing and we're gonna use a very specialized tool called a half normal plot that if you have significant uh, effects, we'll pop them off to the right, away from this lineup near the zero level that's just normally distributed effects. And this works because of the specialized y-axis. But when I start picking, starting with the biggest effect, we see, yes, the catalyst is you know, identified on this plot. Temperature is next. And it goes on from there to, interestingly enough, an interaction of catalyst and temperature which is not uncommon with the chemical process. And then we have more interactions, the interaction of temperature and atmosphere, and then here's the atmosphere effect itself. So we have a nice you know, model that is fairly complicated with these two-factor interactions that are available from our two-level experiment. Our next graphical selection tool, the Pareto chart, which is detailed in another webinar that I gave that's recorded. If you wanna go back and get more information about these charts, go back to the, the webinar I did prior to this on the YouTube channel. But this actually then, you know, I, it, it confirms that you've picked things that are really significant, you know, based on standard T level of 0.05 and a more rigorous Bonferroni pairwise corrected limit, that's the red limit. It's way above both of those. And these effects that I've picked now are going to be modeled. And we're going to look at the p-values of these using the F-test, which Fisher invented. And we see that they're all highly significant, you know, even below as far as what we report, which is 0 0.0001. So this is like a textbook quality experiment. And we have extremely good adjusted and predicted R squareds. And then this adequate precision is a good one as well to see that we have a model that's useful. Then we don't wanna uh, overlook that there could be some abnormalities, some outliers and things like that. And there's three plots that I happen to like in this uh, array that we provide with Steady software. First and foremost is the normal plot. And this is another type of plot, but only used for the residuals. And we actually want all the points to line up on a, let's say covered up by a pencil. This is good, we want this. The residual versus run is another one I like as a certified quality engineer, having done a lot of work in plant process improvement. That one should just be a random scatter, no trends, no points outside of the red line. And then here's another invention by George Box, this one with a guy named Cox, that is helpful for seeing if there's any transformation that might be useful, and there isn't any. So at this point, I'm just gonna press straight ahead here and we see that the effect of catalyst, which had a very strong main effect, is actually moderated by the effect of the temperature. At the low temperature, increasing the catalyst doesn't really increase the response that much. It's significant, but not that, that much. Looking at these 
LSD bars, these significant different bars at either side, they're not overlapping. So there is a significant improvement at low temperature, but the big improvement comes when you increase the temperature and then increase the catalyst. And that's where we're getting these really high levels. Then also there's an effect of uh, atmosphere uh, going to the air, it does degrade the yield, unfortunately, but it's more complicated than that because it depends on the the uh, the effect of the let's go the effect of uh, atmosphere, which is now showing as green for the for the air and red for the nitrogen, becomes much greater at the higher temperature, which is what we want. And so uh, at this point, it's pretty clear that we need to increase the catalyst. We need to increase the temperature. And we need to keep it under the blanket of nitrogen. So we're on the left side of the, uh, the bottom side of the cube here. Actually, it's just 90.29, which is nitrogen, high temperature and high catalyst on this cube plot. And I could fiddle with the axes on this to make it, you know, correlate better. Um, Okay, I like this a little bit better because it's more in alphabetical order. So now we have the catalyst is on the right side high, the temperature is at the upper side, and we've got the nitrogen, which is the front side of the cube at the 90.29. So that's our optimum. We can also do some pretty cool uh, surfaces like this one here. And we could set a flag and you can see that we're getting you know pretty close to uh, over 90%. The actual model, if we were to search out, you know, what that maximum yield is, let's see what we get, putting a stretch target of 100 at the top. And it does look like we've got a prediction of over 90. I would then take this setup that we have and do a series of confirmation runs. And as we collect the, those data points here for the for the follow up, we should see the results coming in right here, you know, in good shape between the prediction interval, and that indicates that that we've confirmed the results. If these all of a sudden started dropping way off, then we wouldn't be able to say we confirmed because it's fallen outside of that interval. Okay, so that's my first uh, run through, and. Um, Ad is asking about the categoric factor and does that create two equations? And absolutely, um, when we go to our analysis of variance, um, what you're gonna see uh, if we go to uh, our, our model, uh, we go to the, the uh, actual equation, you're gonna see there's actually two equations, one for the nitrogen and one for the air. However, with the coded equation, where we're just coding at minus one plus one, we can just use, work with one e equation. So this makes it a lot easier and I highly recommend using coded uh, equations rather than actual equations, because then you can see what the overall average is. You can see the relative impact of the coefficients and whether they're plus or minus, and whether an interaction is synergistic, which is a plus interaction, or antagonistic, which is a negative. So the coded equation is gonna be a lot better. Okay, uh, I like the questions, uh, whether we'll be able to cover them all as we as we go on the fly is another thing, but I'll, I'll come back to the question box later and double check that. Okay, then last but not least on the two level designs, again, to, to reiterate that we have these specialized minimum run designs. And as you get to six or more factors, your standard uh, high resolution designs can be bettered by the minimum run. There's a price to pay with lower power, you get partial aliasing of effects and things like that. So if you can do the standard type of design, that's always better. It'll be more powerful and have more regular aliasing, but certainly as you get into more and more um, factors, we had one client that had 11 factors and they still wanted to get the high resolution. So they did the 11 factor minimum run resolution five. Now, uh, another option of course, is to go to a lower resolution and just do a screening of the main effects and we also have minimum run designs for those. And of course, you'll get by with many fewer runs, but keeping in mind that it'll only give you the main effects, the interactions will be alias still. 
So now moving ahead to response surface methods, you know, after we've done the screening and characterization, and we see from the center points that there's curvature that's significant and important. Then we go to these specialized designs that George Box invented, the central composite, or you can do for two factors a full three-level design, and that would work perfectly, perfectly well. And there's other designs. There's another one called a box Benkin. Box is everywhere. <laughs> or you can do what are called custom optimal designs, uh, which can deal with any space, any polynomial model, and we have complete capability to handle just about any situation you have, whether it's process or product, combined, whatever complex constraints you put in, you can handle that with a computer custom optimal design. But the point of doing response surface methods is once you've gotten close to your peak, to apply a focus on that and then do a design that will uh, adequately approximate that curve using a polynomial model. And this is something that uh, I did when I was working in uh, R&D for specialty chemical. And I had a PhD that I was working with that was very good at doing one factor at a time. And so Bill would methodically run a series of tests on one factor and he'd say, oh, look, we see the peak here. And he would be very excited about that. And then he would set A and then focus his attention on B and he would do another methodical experiment and say, wow, here's a, here's a peak for B and I have it nailed. Well, this was an actual experiment on the yield of a, a, of a chemical. And so I said, Bill, I'm gonna take this and scale it up for these two process factors. And I did a three level design with two factors, which forms nine combinations or runs. And then I replicated the center point a number of times. And from this, I was able to fit a polynomial model, which is what RSM does. That was a function not only of the main effects, but also the interaction of the two, which we can get from the two level design, but also with the three levels, I can get the squared terms. And this forms what's called a quadratic equation. And that's kind of your, your standard equation. And from that, you can map out using Design Expert. And we were able to get the yield from, let's say, 75% up to 95%. And that was worth $2 million a year in added you know, yield for, the, for this very uh, expensive chemical that we were producing. So the multi-factor approach is always going to be a key to really, you know, wringing out the most yield and quality that you can get from your process. So if you start with good subject matter knowledge and then use two level factorial screening and characterization, you can get down to some few factors and then you can do a more in-depth study on the process, measure the responses and fit this polynomial model. And this is what George Box, you know, invented for Imperial Chemical, recognizing that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And with the modern day computing facilities, we can we can generate these surfaces. So what I have here as an example is actually one that uh, is detailed in our tutorial in our software. So what I'm going to suggest is rather than me spending a lot of time on this, if you have design expert or you can download a free trial and you can you can check this out is go to our help tutorials with your free download or with your licensed software. If you haven't done this before, look at the response surface example that I've got here, and you'll see that it's the exact same example that I'm showing on this slide with time, temperature, and catalyst as, as our um, factors. And then the actual structure of this experiment is what George Box invented is called a central composite. It's comprised of the core factorial, which is a cube, the center points, which are at the center, and these will be uh, replicated a number of times. And then these axial points that are coming out represented by stars provide an additional level, and you actually have five levels, the minus star level, let's say, the minus one level, the center, which is zero coded, the plus one in the factorial space, and then the plus star or alpha, they call it, for the coding. 
this alpha is something that has to be determined. And I'll go ahead and open up this tutorial data, but I'll, I'll leave it to you to actually work through some of the details. It's completely laid out um, there in that tutorial. So here it just, again, it reiterates, we're looking at time temperature catalyst. And then the way this is built, it's very simple. You go to the response surface section, central composite. There's lots of options in terms of blocking how far out the points go. Study that. This happened to be broken up into two blocks by day or by equipment. We had two responses. And then uh, as you analyze this, this data, what you're going to find is that the first response conversion re does require these squared terms, and there's some that are highly significant. The second response is fitted adequately with just a linear model. And ultimately, what you can do is you can trade off maximizing the conversion, let's say at a minimum of 80, with a stretch target of 100, with activity, which is a quality attribute that they wanted to target. And let's just say that you say, well, let's just say we want to hit 60 and we want to go from 57 to 63. I don't think these are the actual, this is the actual target, but now that we have the models, we can put in whatever we want for our goals. And the end result is that you're able to, with the right settings of time temperature catalyst, you know, get conversion above your minimum that you're looking for at the same time hitting activity, you know, on target. And uh, so look, going back to the original conversion in 3D surface, we see there's a certain, you know, setup of temperature, time, and catalyst. But what we really have to do is also make sure we get it on target for the activity at 60. So this combination gives you both of uh, what you want. And so we create what's called a sweet spot that gives us, you know, the conversion to where we want and, and gives us the activity to where we want. And this one, we actually have a couple of sweet spots. If I lower the catalyst on this example, we lose the ability, you know, we still have some, some open window, but it's not as good. So this gives you an illustration of the advantages of applying a more advanced technique, you know, which is response surface methods. So uh, I just want to throw this out, and you can get uh, this from the slides that are going to be posted to our website. Uh, but I found a couple of good examples for oil, gas, and petrochemical. One was uh, the experimental analysis of diesel hydrotreating reactor, and the other was thermal cracking. And I can show you uh, real quickly how those shape up. So the first one is the diesel. And if you're interested in getting these uh, data files, send me an email afterwards and I'll send, the, I'll send these files to you. And I was able to copy out of the original publications and using our powerful import function, uh, get them set up within the program without a lot of effort, but it'll save you time if, if you wanna look at these to ask me for the actual design expert files. So here we have a, an experiment that, that has, um, you know, factorial levels, which are low and high. It has additional levels going outside of the original range, which are these axial levels. Um, and then it has, you know, a series of center points. And uh, I don't know what the original random order was, so it's not really set up quite right in the random order, but it's got the right data in it. And it turns out that, we were able to uh, see a, that a quadratic equation fits this. And some of the terms um, we, can, we can actually auto select out of here to try to reduce the, the model to just what's significant. And it didn't have any significant lack of fit. That was good, you know, good R squareds, adequate precisions. So this is just an example from uh, our field of oil, chemical, oil, uh, gas, oil, and petrochemical of, of how they, applied uh, a study to actually, in this case, reduce the sulfur was their main focus. And uh, so our, our, our ideal conditions on this one 
are going to be at the lower sulfur. And I notice here that the pressure actually dropped out entirely from the model. So it ends up just being a function of flow rate and temperature is really all that matters. And then if you want to minimize the sulfur and just put a stretch target in, you can get a condition low flow rate, uh, you know, temperature at 354 that, that minimizes the sulfur. So that's pretty cool. That's one example. And then uh, another one from uh, oil, gas, and petrochemical is this thermal cracking using a full three-level factorial design. And I put that into the program as well, just to see what would happen. Uh, this one's got temperature, time, pressure, and they had a whole series of different yields that they were trying to accomplish. And so let's just look at the, the coefficients table to see what I did here to fit it. It looks like I used a reduced model for the distillate that just had the B squared and it, AB and B squared. And then for some reason, just the linear models suffice for the gasoline, kerosene, and diesel yields. And so, for example, just looking at conversion, which is the full quadratic, here's a, a, a surface that we, we can look at. And obviously, we want the conversion to be maximized. The red dots are the points here for this full three-level design. Some are replicated. You can see that. And then doing the numeric optimization to maximize all of the yields produces this combination of temperature, time, and pressure. And my take home from this is that probably they should consider even going higher in temperature, longer in time, and higher in pressure to get all these yields up to an even higher level. So this could be just the beginning of some further work. But it was a nice success from um, oil, gas, and petrochemical. And then uh, going back to uh, the question uh, that we have here, Ad uh, is, is asking, you know, um, should we consider reducing the models? And I would say yes. Um, and then the mixture designs, I'm going to cover that. Um, when do you still use a fractional design if there are also minimum run designs? Yeah, why do you use? I, I would use, I wouldn't necessarily go straight to the minimum run. There's also minimum run response surface methods, but the problem with those is they get highly aliased um, and they get partially aliased and the power is less because there's fewer runs. Um, right on, Ad, it's great that you can now ask your questions to an expert. Um, I'm happy to continue to uh, provide answers, you know, all along here. So continue, you know, coming in with those questions, that's great, and follow up afterwards. But Ad, since you asked, what do we do if there's a mixture? I just happen to have a few slides here for the last 10 minutes or so. And uh, the thing is that as a chemical engineer, this is very interesting to me because, of course, the stoichiometry of the ingredients in, in the uh, mixture were really important. And typically, I'd be working with a PhD chemist who didn't really embrace the idea of empirical st studies using, you know, uh, DOE. And so uh, I, I began to work, you know, more closely with the, the chemists to, to work with them to start off by just doing a more uh, proactive uh, and multi-component type study, which we call a mixture design. And this was pioneered by Henri Chaffey at University of California. So he, he came after George Box's invention in 1951 basically applying the response surface methods to within the mixture space. And what we're going to see in the mixture space is we're going to shift over from an orthogonal graphic space like we saw with the contours over to this trilinear space. And sometimes I've seen this referred to as a phase diagram. And another term I've seen is ternary diagram. And I always thought of that as ternary, T-U-R-N, because you have to turn this graph around to read off the axes. And just to get an idea uh, from the group is uh, put your hand up if you've, if you've seen the, um, a diagram like this with a triangle. John, Ad. Okay, so you have seen that Marion, of course, Mary Marion. And I'm sure Wayne has, has come across this and maybe some others. But it's really the key to applying good uh, experimentation when you're working with a formulation. 
to now kind of shift your attention for what we would call factors to ingredients and we kind of shift the language a little bit here for our input variables from the word factors to the word components you know is kind of the scientific name but most people might just call them ingredients and then uh, what makes this uh, process of this mixture design work is that it's really a function of proportions of stoichiometry that's the key not the amounts and this certainly works for you know beverages like this milkshake you know the relative proportion of, of the milk fat the sugar the chocolate you know is what's going to make this delightful for the taste then if we fix the total which typically is 100 weight percent but it could be volume percent or mole percent or it could be one glass or one barrel for a barrel of oil then we can facilitate the mixture model what often happens at this stage is people have learned about using multi-factor approach and so they think well we should be able to apply this for a mixture just as well so here's a student <laughs> that's attended the class for design of experiments that daddy's taught and he's thinking he's pretty smart now and so when he sets up his lemonade stand on this hot august day he says well look i'm going to do an experiment first with either one lemon which is going to be my low level that i learned from mark to code as minus one and i'm going to also do a high level uh we'll code that plus and this would be either one lemon or two lemons and we could call this factor a and over here i'm going to do a second factor and i'm going to do a multi-factor experiment with both a and b going from low to high well, uh, I won't belabor this, but I'll just point out, and you can see this pretty readily, that if we're just taking a sip of this, it doesn't matter whether we have one lemon and one glass of sugar water, or two lemons and two glasses of sugar water, the taste will be the same. We've just scaled up the recipe. So this would be a really bad idea. A much better idea would be to, to condense these two things into one variable, which could be the ratio of the two, but I put a number line in here where zero is the lowest level and one is the highest level. So the coding for the mixture will be zero to one. And over on the right side is pure sugar water. And if we do an experiment here and we have a little taste panel, they're gonna like this sugar water, I guarantee you. And if we had a one to nine scale, they might rate that a seven. Over here on the left side uh, is another option, which would be to just squeeze a pure lemon out but I guarantee you that would be pretty sour. And on a nine point scale, maybe we might be generous to give it a three. But if we continue to do this experiment with different blends, and we could also replicate a couple of these and we could set this up in Design Expert, I don't have time to show you, but it'd be readily done with a two component mixture design and Design Expert. Um, we could then generate an equation. And this is the equation that was developed by Chaffe. I just call it a mixture model. It predicts the response y as a function of what you get with the pure x1, which is the sugar water. So the beta for this is seven. And then the next uh, part of the equation is what happens if you get the pure x2, which is a pure lemon, that's not very good, three. And then what's interesting here is that you get a synergism. And let's say this coefficient is eight, which is one, uh, if we multiply one fourth of eight, which is a half half blend, we get this deflection here and because of the way this is tilted if we did a numeric optimization we might see that we can get up to a level of eight if we mix up one quarter of a lemon with three quarters of a sugar water so this is a really cool idea you know an example that you might try at home to mix up two things to get something better than either one alone now if we have three ingredients and we consider uh that each one is going from zero to 100 percent then we can readily see that this low, low, low level is not possible and the high, high, high level is not possible. But what we do is we shift over to this special paper. Um, I'm, I'm gonna call this ternary paper. And each of these corners represents 100% of each ingredient. And along the edges are binary blends, like this is the binary blend of B and C, A and B and A and C. And you can rule this out and once you know any two ingredients like if we said we've got 50 percent of the a ingredient and 
B is going to go in this direction. If we had 20% of that, 10, 20. Then if I drew this right, we, we form an intersection and we can just simply read off the third ingredient, which has got to be 30 to achieve the 100%. And so this paper makes sure that you stay within uh, the 100% range. And I first came across this in metallurgy. And what we were looking for was stainless steel that was made out of 18% chromium, which is 18% of the way from the bottom of the top, 8% nickel, which is going from left to right. And then once you do these two, two lines, the intersection is formed and the rest of it has to be the 74% of iron. And anything else is not gonna make stainless steel. Here's another example, and this one, just to be funny, at the rocket lab, the guy is gonna come up and sneak behind the guy putting the final nail on the nose cone. But if you did an experiment with these solid rocket fuels, which are the corners here for the pure fuels, the edges for the binary blend, and did some check blends like this, you could form what's called a special cubic model, which oftentimes with mixtures, you have to go to the third order. So that is the exception. Ad was asking about going to third order. Normally I wouldn't if it's a process study, but for mixtures, at least go to this special cubic level potentially. And in this case, we see a synergism of all three things coming together at the middle. Okay, well, we've reached you know the, the end of the time here, but I do have one uh, case that was very valuable for protecting a patent and saved uh, the oil company I worked with when I first started a million dollars by protecting their patent. And this had to do with uh, Octane. And they actually just ran what was called a screening design, which I mentioned, just doing a broad and shallow experiment. This can be done with mixture design as well. And by doing this, they were able to look at many different Octanes and combinations thereof. And they were able to get a result that show that certain octanes uh, like C additives to, to the gasoline would raise the octane K and B, and some would actually decrease the octane. And so they were able to study fairly quickly which additives improved the octane and which reduced it. Now, if you did a more in-depth study than the screening, you could actually fit special cubic type fit and that this is what it would look like. And to make it more dramatic, I could I could put in, um, you know, just a little range on the gradient here to try to make it look more dramatic. And so this is showing an example of what a special cubic surface would look like in the triangle. So that's about all I'm going to be able to do here. Um, being already one minute over, uh, although we started a couple minutes late just to leave time for people to to uh, join in with our go to webinar. But really the main thing is to um, trim out any kind of one factor at a time experimentation, right? And go with the multi-factor approach. You know, once you get anywhere near to where you wanna be for the your process, then use these two level designs, use response surface methods like I demonstrated from the published cases, have been very successful for oil, gas, and petrochemical for process optimization, such as in a refinery. But then don't uh, ignore the fact that you can fiddle with the formulations using mixture design and or even combinations of, of those two using optimal custom. And this will be very easy with either the design expert or Stadis 360, which is a newer uh, version of design expert that's supercharged with the addition of Python um, scripting and things like that. So for the more advanced power users, consider moving up to this Stadis 360. That looks like this, and it's got the Python scripting and some other tools such as Gaussian process modeling and things like that. But normally design expert will be plenty fine for your typical industrial R&D person. As far as references are concerned, uh, I've written this trilogy of books um, that cover these basics of uh, process, screening, 
and characterization. Optimization using responsiveness methods is covered in the second book. And then for the mixture design, you know, pick up this formulation simplified book. And these are readily available from Amazon and such, and also available uh, as eBooks. For further education, I highly recommend you consider attending a public workshop that Stadies provides and go to our website and you'll see when these are, are, are available. Um, and if you're interested, if you have enough people in a group, let's say six or more, contact our workshops because we can do a customized private workshop for you using Zoom uh, at a distance. All right, well, that concludes my presentation. Uh, and if you wanna log off at this point, that, that's fine. Um, uh, we'll call it good. And I just hope that you can make the most from every experiment using these powerful DOE tools. And if you're in the oil, gas, and petrochemical R&D, these will be perfect. But really any type of uh, industrial uh, segment, whether you're making things or you're producing stuff, design of experiments is gonna really help you accelerate your work. So I, I highly promote that. So again, thank you for attending. Uh, that concludes our, our webinar. Now I'm gonna just stay on a little bit and uh, see if there's any uh, further questions that, that people have. And so I'm first gonna check the chat. And um, going back to Ad's question regarding mixture designs, Ad has got the software and he's got the books. And in regards to the mixtures, which design do you start with? Um, I would recommend, and as you've recognized, Ad, that the simplex lattice design might be a good good point to start. And uh, so, uh, for example, let me close out um, the Stadis 360 and going back to Design Expert. Uh, here we have this mixture design for the additives for the octane improvement. Let's say that we select uh, from our additives three that are really good, the additive C, K, and B. And so we decided to do a three additive octane mixture experiment. Okay, so this would be now an optimization that we're gonna do. It's not response surface because that's for process, but it's a mixture. And so I would say, okay, so now we've got uh, additive C, additive K, and I forgot the other one, but let's just say J. And uh, we're going to uh, mix up an additive a uh, mixture of 100 weight percent. And we're gonna add that to our, our gasoline, of course, that's gonna make up you know the rest of it. And we're gonna go from zero to 100% as our first idea. Okay, and we could do this and it would form, we could form what's called a simplex lattice for whatever order we want. I would suggest special cubic. And I would replicate some of the runs as, as recommended here. And this would make a nice little blending experiment. I usually recommend 12 or more, you know, to check on the octane and see if we can find a, a blend that is better than any individual alone. And so this makes an experiment that has, you know, 100% of each of the individual octane additives, but also does uh, overall blend of all three. And then these are what are called check blends, like the two thirds K and one third of C, et cetera. And from this, experiment we could see that possibly there's something like their solid rocket fuel where all three together give you something uh, better than you would expect but let's say that one of these uh, uh, additives is quite expensive and we we just can't we simply can't afford to put in too much of it and so let's say we're going to cut this off at 50 percent but the other additives are cheap so that's fine what happens in this case is it's no longer forming a triangle because we've cut the top off and we've created what's called a frustrum. So at this point, we switch to the optimal custom design. And here we can still say we wanna fit a special cubic and using optimal design, which I, I really can't get into too much detail on it, but that we let the program select, you know, which, which points to run, let's say, and now I'm gonna finish off a new experiment. And this one never goes above um, 50%, I guess this is the one that I, I cut off. 
you know, for the first ingredient. And so we're creating a design that uh, is an optimal custom within the triangle, but the top of the triangle is, is cut off. You see that? And you see where these red points are is what the computer picked enough points so that we can fit the special cubic. Um, for some reason, it didn't pick this one over here, but you could add that in pretty readily, you know, if you identify what the coordinates are for that. Uh, we could we could put an experiment in at this point, which is 50-50 uh, of X1 and X, X2. Okay, so that just gives you kind of a quick idea of um, of how we can apply a mixture design. Let's see. Ad is asking for the data files. Uh, Ad, uh, if you would send me an email to marketstudies.com and anybody else that's interested to get the data files, uh, that would be good. And John has left, and thank you for the seminar. You're welcome, John. Um, and then, um, why do you choose a special cubic? Um, okay, so a couple more questions, Ad, uh, and then we'll probably wrap it up. If, if you have different responses, you want to optimize both responses. Uh, on one response, A and B are important, and B and C are important on the second response. So there's different models uh, for response one and two. That's correct. How do you know where to set B? Well, that's the problem because you're going to have to set B, that's a, a factor that's for both response one and two, at a compromise point that's going to accomplish both response one objective and response two objective. And that's why we're using desirability as a, as a metric, as a utility function. So by, by scaling for each response from zero to one, we can apply this desirability trade-off. And that way we can find these compromises that you have to have, you know, for example, on on factor B in your example. So, you know, take a look at the numeric optimization. There is a tutorial that covers that, you know, in the more advanced end of the response surface and mixture design tutorials, and you'll see what I'm talking about there. And then the special cubic, um, that is a matter of judgment call, you know, how you design your experiment, whether you want to design it to fit a linear, which would be a screening design that I showed you for the, for the octane, we have many, many uh, inputs and you want to just do a broad and shallow design that will identify just the, the big effects, the, the main component effects or main factor effects. That would be one reason to go with a linear type thing. But as you begin to optimize on fewer factors or components, you can afford to increase the order and you're now getting into the nonlinear uh, part of your, your surface. And so what model you design for depends on where you're at in your experimental program. In the early stages, you're gonna go with lesser models that are linear or two-factor interaction. And as you get to the later stages where you narrow down the field to a few factors or components, then you're gonna do a more of a higher order model, a quadratic or even a special cubic. So you do have more runs and that's why we need to cut down the number of factors or components first before we get into that in-depth study. That's why we have that strategy of experimentation, of screening characterization, and optimization. Okay, so that's it for the, the questions that have been brought up. Um, what I'm gonna suggest at this point then is, if you would please uh, go ahead and follow up with email, uh, either to request the uh, data files and or if you have further questions, go ahead and send those in and I'll address those then, you know, now that we're done with the seminar. So thank you for attending, everybody. I'm going to uh, break off at this point, but I wish you all the best of luck and hope to hear from all of you in the future.